Hi everyone. So you're looking for a home. You've decided to finally get in the home market after binge watching every episode of House Hunters on HGTV. Or maybe you've binge watched every episode of Selling Sunset on Netflix. Or maybe you're just tired of living in your parents' basement. Anyway, so in this video, we're going to walk you through the seven steps of home buying uh, so that you know what the process is going to be like and what you need to look out for along the way. And stay tuned at the end. We got a couple of little bonus items for you, so you want, don't want to miss that. Step one is getting your financial house in order. You need to understand where you stand financially, what your credit score is, how much debt you have, and uh, maybe some of the work that you need to do to, to get that uh, credit rating up. And in addition, having reserves available for any future issues that you might have with the house so that you have some money set aside for once you've bought the property. Not to mention potential closing costs that you might have to come up with in addition to that down payment. But also keep in mind that there's a number of down payment assistance programs out there. Mm -hmm. So be sure to talk to your lender or your realtor about those programs. Yep. Step number two, get pre-approved with the lender, or if you're paying cash, get your proof of funds together. If you are gonna be getting a loan, the lender will need things like your W-2 statements, uh, any bank statements or credit card statements with whatever debt you might have, um, things like that to help them be able to understand where you are financially and what you will be able to afford. And while some of us might not always have the best credit, uh, you need to keep in mind that you, know, you need to share everything with your lender mm -hmm. because they're going to find out anyway. So go, it's better to go forward. They can tell you what programs and what assistance that they might have available to you to help you in your circumstance or other options that you might have that you might not have ever thought of. So don't make the mistake of trying to hide your credit because they're going to find out anyway. Yep. And if you happen to be lucky enough to be purchasing a property with cash, don't make the mistake of thinking that you can put in an offer without proof of funds. We actually had a situation recently where we had a seller who received two offers on their property. These offers were almost identical. We're talking about less than $2,000 net difference in price, very similar closing dates, other terms, all very similar. The big difference that ended up making the decision for the seller a little bit easier was that one of the offers had proof of funds available immediately at the time that they made the offer, and the other offer was not able to provide proof of funds for another five days. Yeah, the seller ended up taking the lower offer of the two. Mm -hmm. and it wasn't a big difference, but she had the confidence that the, or the buyer with the proof of funds uh, actually had the funds in hand. Step three, I know this is going to sound a little self-serving, but find a realtor in your area that you can work with over the long haul. So go out, find some good realtors, talk to your friends. Maybe they have some recommendations for you. Interview two or three realtors. This might be a long process. You want to make sure you're comfortable with them and that you can go through some potentially difficult times, depending on the market working with your realtor. So do that. They're going to guide you through this process and answer your questions and tell you what's going to happen next so that you have peace of mind throughout the process. Yeah, and something else that you might not think about when you're interviewing uh, is just how do you get along with them? Does your personality click with that agent's personality? Because again, if you're working with them for six months, you don't want to be working with someone that drives you crazy every time you have to talk to them. So do also consider personality along with knowledge and experience and all of those sorts of things when you're interviewing your agents. Real quick clue, if they don't call you back fairly soon after you call them, might be a good person to not go with. Just a thought. <laughs> Step four, narrow down your search and begin looking at properties. When you start your search, you want to really begin based on your price point, which you should already know based on what your lender told you you qualify for. We can tell you that there is nothing worse than looking at $500,000 properties when you can only afford to buy a $300,000 property. Because as soon as you've done that, every $300,000 property you look at is now going to be a disappointment. 
It's never going to meet your expectations when you already saw a $500,000 property. So you've got to start your search based on what's a realistic price for you to afford. And then you want to take other things into consideration, like what area do you want to live in? How far is it from work that you want to commute? What kind of schools, if you have kids in school, what kind of schools are in the area? So those are some of the things. Now for me, how close am I to the nearest golf course? That's important to me. So, you know, take a, take a look at uh, what, what it is on your list that's important to you to have nearby, and then make sure that uh, you look in the appropriate area and at the appropriate price. As your search continues, you will probably make some edits to your search criteria. That's totally fine. It's a normal part of the process. But unfortunately, we aren't mind readers yet. So Not yet. We're, we're working, working on, on it. it. <laughs> so as you continue through the process, make sure you communicate that to your realtor. Um, if you feel like you're getting frustrated that they are showing you properties that you are interested in, make sure you have communicated that to them so that they know that that's not what you're looking for anymore. Um, that will really help uh, speed up the process of finding homes that are, are worth looking at for you. And when you're in the home, be sure to use all of your senses. You know, does the property feel like it's sloped, the, the house itself? Maybe the, there's a foundation issue going on there. Does it smell funny? Follow your instincts, understand, look around, touch things, under the sink, is it damp? Is there a pipe leaking? Those kinds of things. And your, a good realtor will help you with those things as well. They'll identify and point out these things. Are there stains in the ceiling? Maybe there was a water leak at some point in time. These are all important considerations. That doesn't mean that it disqualifies the home, but it, may, it helps that you're aware of these issues, that there might be some other issues, and then you can uh, negotiate with the seller on some of those items and make sure they're either repaired or you get concessions in the closing of the deal so that you can make the necessary repairs in the end. Yep. And with technology these days, if you are an out-of-state client and not able to come and look at the property in person, we have way more options than we used to with things like FaceTime or Zoom. We can show you properties, we can tag team and drive around a neighborhood with one person driving and one person showing you around um, and just kind of give you an idea of, of the house and the neighborhood that way without you having to spend a ton of money on flying back and forth every weekend. We work with a lot of military here with the, the Air Force Base here in Tucson, and a lot of those folks don't have the opportunity to come to Tucson yeah. beforehand. And so we've done that with a number of our clients, uh, drive them around the neighborhood so they have a feel of the neighborhood, walk them through the homes, show them things close up, far back, so they have a really good perspective of what they are getting into before they actually arrive. Uh, nothing more dis disappointing than buying a home sight unseen, which unfortunately some people have to do, and then moving there and, and getting surprises. So far we've had pretty happy clients with yeah. our out of state moves, so. The next step in the process is finding a home that you love and making an offer on it. Of course, it's going to be within your budget and your uh, realtor can help you with a market-based competitive offer and depending on market conditions, that might mean that you have to be very aggressive in your offer or that you might be uh, aggressive in, in your offer in the other way that uh, maybe the, looking for some seller concessions in that process. So finding that home, making sure that you're loving it, seeing yourself in it in the future is really, really important in this step. You want to talk about some of the considerations of, of uh, the offer? Yeah, so there's a lot more than just price. and. With the last few years of properties going way above list price, um, this has really come into play a lot where people are wondering, what can I do if I can't make an offer that's 50,000 over list price? Well, price is not the only thing that a seller is looking at. The seller might also be looking at the type of fi financing you're using. They might be looking at what your closing timeline is. They might be looking at how long your inspection period is, or if you're waiving Repairs, I would not suggest waiving inspections themselves, but if you're waiving a certain dollar amount of repairs, all of those things that we can work into an offer can help 
make you more competitive if maybe price is not something that you can be quite as competitive on as you would like to be. Even something like earnest money, how much earnest money you put down indicates yep. to the seller how serious you are about your, your purchase yep. and how committed you are to not backing out. Absolutely. And we actually had a situation uh, with this earlier this year where we had a, a seller who needed close to a 90 day closing timeline uh, because of when their move was. And again, it was another military client that was reliant on the military to move them. And so the timelines weren't entirely within the seller's control other than knowing that they needed quite a while. And so they ended up, they got multiple offers and they ended up picking the one that allowed for a very extended closing timeline because that's what they needed to make their transition uh, more successful. <laughs> and after you submit that that uh, that proposal, uh, the seller has basically three options. The, the seller can accept your offer as it is written. They can counter, and the counter could be on not just price, but the terms. Uh, maybe they needed that extended closing. Maybe they're looking for a, a shorter closing. Always talk to your lender if you're looking for a shorter closing because they will tell you what's possible and what's not possible. And then finally, the seller can simply reject the offer, which means the deal's off. Also, for the sellers out there, you need to know that when you counter uh, an offer, that basically does remove the original offer off the table. You, uh, the, the seller can't counter, and then if you say, no, I don't wanna do that, uh, they can't come back and say, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll take your original offer. Once they counter, that offer's off the table. Keep that in mind throughout this process. Step six is escrow, or as we like to call it, the road to closing. Escrow typically starts with the earnest money check being deposited. And escrow is a neutral third party that helps to process the transaction and make sure that the process goes smoothly and everything gets to both parties uh, as needed and as applicable. And they're really there to follow the instructions of the contract and any addenda that also happen after going under contract. So they are, are bound to follow those rules that are laid out uh, ahead of time for them. Also during the escrow period is your due diligence period where you want to have inspections done on the house. These could include anything from a general inspection, roof inspections, HVAC inspections, sewer inspections, make sure that that's actually still connected to the city sewer. Also this time is uh, the time that you were do the legal review uh, for use of the property. So what are the CCNRs? What are the deed restrictions that are in place? And then things like, which should come up on the title review uh, during this period of time. Let's say we wanted to put a swimming pool in our backyard. Well, during this time, we might learn that there's a natural gas pipeline underneath our backyard and we actually can't build a pool. It's during this time of, uh, that you want to determine that because if that's really how you want to use the home, well, this might not be the home for you. So this is an opportunity to legally back out of the contract and get your earnest money back. In addition, during the escrow period, you will also receive your title commitment from preliminary title commitment from the title company. And this is your opportunity to look at the title insurance that will be provided upon closing for the property as well as any exclusions that they might have. So here you wanna look for things like, are there any liens on the property, like mechanics liens from unpaid contractors? Are there any easements, like we mentioned before, uh, for um, utilities running through the property that might prohibit you from putting a pool in? In addition, this is also the time that you want to take a look at the different ways that you can take title or how you will hold the property uh, in your name, as there are different ways that that can be done and different rules uh, across different states. So this is your time to make sure that that is all uh, looking how you want it to. Well, and, and what's interesting is in Arizona, that is deemed a legal uh, advice type work and realtors are not uh, allowed to advise you on how to take title. Yes. So you might actually have to hire an attorney ever so briefly it, it, to look at the different options in your state on how to take title and what might be uh, most advantageous for you uh, moving forward in your life. 
It's also during this time that we have to continue shepherding the loan process. So while you were pre-approved earlier and pre-qualified uh, for, for a certain amount, now we're getting down to the nitty gritty and the, uh, what's the name of the loan department? Underwriting. Underwriting. Uh, and underwriting at the bank or mortgage company is doing their work to actually finalize your loan. Want to make sure that that process is moving along so that you can close on time. Keep in contact with your lender. Uh, sometimes during really busy times, you're going to have to write herd. During this process also, the lender will be asking for an appraisal on the property. We'll want to make sure that the contract price and the appraisal price are, are equal, if not having the appraisal be even more than the contract price so that the lender has no inhibitions about lending you the money. If it comes in under, hopefully your realtor included an appraisal contingency in the contract so that you can then go back, either cancel the contract or renegotiate with the seller on a different price or seller concessions so that the lender can approve the loan. In addition, during this time, if you're someone who doesn't regularly check your email, you will need to be regularly checking your email. That's going to be the primary form of communication from the lender and their whole underwriting team. And so they will be reaching out on a fairly regular basis, sending you updates, requesting more documents. And you really need to be paying attention to this because if you miss those emails for a week, that could put the whole process behind and then we could potentially not be making the closing date. Step seven, taking possession of your home. Woohoo! You are yes. finally there. The home is no, now yours. It is recorded at the county recorder's office and you get the keys. So what now? Well, before the day of closing, you will want to have uh, contacted all of the utility companies that service the property to tell them to switch over the services into your name. And you wanna do this beforehand because if the utility companies shut off the service, then there's a very good chance that you will end up paying a reconnect fee. And that's just an unnecessary payment that we can avoid. Well, in addition, be prepared to pay deposits depending yeah. on what jurisdiction you live in. S many utilities require advanced payment. Now you'll get that credited back after a year of service, but that's another part of the have some money in reserve yep. because a lot of people don't anticipate those deposits. Also, while we're talking about this, while we we're excited about moving into our own place, we also need to contact the utilities about the place that we're moving from yep. to make sure that whoever's taking over that property or if you need to uh, just close those accounts, close those accounts so you don't have two sets of utilities running at the same time. That's happened. Yep, absolutely. And we have an example of, of one where the client uh, didn't get it transferred in time, it got disconnected, and on this one it happened to be the gas company. And for the gas company to reconnect the service, not only was there a fee, but they also had to come out to inspect every uh, part of the house that was being serviced by the gas. So the stove, the water heater, the dryer, all of those sorts of things, they had to come back out and inspect before they would turn it back on. And cold showers sometimes are fun, but not all the time. More fun here in the summer than some other places. That's true. <laughs> we won't talk about the lack of cold water here in the desert. <laughs> It's not a selling feature. Maybe another video. I, another video. Other kinds of things that need to be transferred that you might not think about, does the home have solar? A lot of these are leased accounts, uh, and so you, you'll need to get those transferred. Smart devices in the home need to be transferred, those accounts, so that you actually can get access to them. Automatic shipments. I'm a big fan of Amazon, bringing me my household goods on a regular basis. I never run low on supplies. I can get, well, anyway, uh, that's not the point. The point is that you wanna make sure you transfer those. Also, all, any loans that you have, credit cards, those kinds of things, you gotta reach out to those uh, institutions. Most of that stuff you can do online, but you need to update your addresses on all of that. Yep, and finally, you probably want to schedule your movers ahead of time so that everything is ready to go on the day that you are wanting to move. We always recommend movers. We have moved a few times. We're tired of moving and we don't move by ourselves anymore. 
we are past the beer and pizza bribing friends part of moving, so we recommend hiring some movers to make your life a little bit easier during that part of the process. And right now, as we speak, we're, we're in the midst of the great migration where folks are actually moving, not just across town, but uh, across the country. And if you're trying to schedule a, an interstate uh, mover, you may be a couple months out on scheduling those. So do this well in advance of your intended move so that you can be sure that you actually have a mover that can move you and make the delivery there. No, nothing worse than moving into a house and having nothing to sit on. Yeah. So now you, you have the, the, the shorthand version of the buying a new home. We've included a, a, a buyer's guide down below. Click on the link and you can download the PDF on, on this whole process that we just described in this video. So uh, please uh, don't hesitate to do that. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. In addition, we also, if you are in the Tucson area, would love to work with you. So our contact information is also down below. You can reach out to us that way if you're looking to buy or sell here. And if you don't happen to be in the Tucson area, not looking to buy here, uh, we also can help connect you with agents in all other areas of the country and really the world. And so there's also a link down below where you can fill out some information on the type of transaction and the type of property that you might be buying or selling. And uh, our team can help connect you with a great agent in your area to help you through that process. So thank you. Uh, if you like this video, please click the like button. And if you uh, wanna hear more about real estate and lifestyle in the Southern Arizona, please subscribe. Uh, we'd love to have you on board. Mm -hmm.